Well, I have to try to bring us home, at least for the formal portion of this <laughs> evening. And I've had dozens of these conversations with Peter over the years, but first time as a state senator. So this is an exciting <laughs> night. And uh, um, appreciate you, Peter, and the team for bringing us this beautiful uh, location. And yeah, my, you know, there's a lot of talk, obviously, in state houses. And I'd say that's really where the action is uh, in this country right now, in the state houses, um, about uh, AI. And my colleagues are talking about it. And I have to remind them that, yeah, AI is not new. As mentioned, I had a company, Lex Machina. Kim was an investor. Thank you, Kim. Um, word machine or law machine. Uh, actually, James Cham, who's here, told us to call it big data for law. Remember, everything was big data at the time, big data. Um, but yeah, we called it eventually AI for uh, law. And at the time, we said there's really three major sectors of the economy that are untouched, really, by data and AI. At the time, law, healthcare, and government. Those three. So when you say that, when I think about the case for optimism, where is there really room? for AI to uh, really elevate society, law, healthcare, and government. And law, that's what we did in Lex Machina. It really wasn't about, it wasn't at all, all about replacing lawyers. It was using algorithms to mine through millions of pages of lawsuits that, and discover information that never was known before about judges, about parties, about uh, really data in the system to help people understand the system and practice law better, and really more information to analyze. And in healthcare, Andrew Ng, who's one of our advisors, used to say, again, this isn't new. He'd say 15 years ago, don't get your kids, don't tell your kids to be radiologists when they grow up, right? Um, but the reality is say we still do have radiologists, but they're using AI to do better, uh, do their job, I think, better. You know, if we had this maybe a few years ago, maybe my dad would have lived, you know, years longer um, if the radiologist had been uh, consulting uh, AI images at the time and that analysis. Um, and then you think about drug discovery, and you think about simulation and optimization on those NVIDIA chips, like folks like Sandbox AQ and others are doing. We have that possibility of now taking years, you know, certainly a year or two or more, off of drug discovery. So we get drugs to market much faster and save companies billions of dollars, literally, in developing uh, these drugs. Government, I don't know what the uses are, you tell me. Um, what the government, how government should be using AI to serve the people better. But I think there are opportunities, and you'll tell us maybe what some of those are. I will say, you know, my, my friend Jack Hittery, he talks about RAGs, retrieve, retrieval augmented generations. So these are, this is AI on top of, say, a proprietary data set, could be on top of a set of nursing books, say, for example, then to use that information to retrieve that uh, from that proprietary data set, then to upskill people in various ways, as we know, uh, will have to happen um, going forward in the future. Um, now, again, this is not unfettered. So we talk about healthcare. I have a bill called Physicians Make Decisions. Why is that bill necessary? It's because we've already seen uh, insurance companies using algorithms to deny care to people. By the way, this only happens in the US. The US is the only country where we actually deny care, and we spend a lot of money going back and forth, friction, as Peter talked about, uh, to actually deny people care, and they're using algorithms to do that. So I have a bill, Physicians Makes Decisions. I have a bill around transparency, as we just heard from Adobe, watermarking and fingerprinting. I have a bill around uh, earlier, uh, education, but really it's a work group bill. How can, what are the positive uses of education in the classroom? And then what are the negative things? How can teachers even think about their kids using, um, using generative AI and, and how can they block it if they want to block it or how do they want their kids to actually use it? And we're doing that with the superintendent of public instruction, doing a bill around, around deep fakes and around uh, revenge porn, making closing loopholes so AI is included in those. So there's lots of, uh, there's 35 bills in California right now uh, in the legislature. So if you care about this and you want to get involved, Scott Wiener has a bill around public compute, Cal Compute. So there's lots of opportunities right now uh, to get involved in this issue. So um, I'd say that's what Peter said, you know, optimist, but um, you know, there's concerns as well. And I think that's our job as legislators to think what are those uh, risks in the future and how do we, can we mitigate those risks? I'll say the last case for optimism I would say, and I thought about it today when I see all these great uses, I actually think that in the world of AI with all this incredible, you know, generative AI, that being human is gonna be more important than ever the human connection will be valued more than ever before. Thank you for having me here, Peter.